I'm Isis Arabay, the Artistic Director of the March on Washington Film Festival, and we are continuing our Scholars Symposium with our next session. You know, the Civil Rights Movement attracted an army of artists, writers, painters, musicians, vocalists, dancers, poets, actors, and directors who lent their dollars, their time, and most of all, their talents to further the struggle. Our next talk is about using the arts to propel the movement toward human rights and social justice. And I'm especially pleased to welcome our next speaker because she has been a longtime friend. And you know, you have those friends who you know are fabulous and they do great work and they're very talented. And you kind of take that for granted until one day I was at uh, Lincoln Center, I live in New York, speaking with a programmer there. I happened to mention her name and she said, you know her? I have her book. I mean, it's dog it. It's my Bible. And that gave me a whole new respect for Donna Walker Kuhn. She is the founder of Walker International Communications Group, a boutique marketing, press, and audience development consulting agency. Her team specializes in multicultural marketing, group sales, multicultural press, and promotional events. Donna is widely acknowledged as the nation's foremost expert in audience development by not only Arts and Business Council, but by many people in her field. And she's devoted her professional career to increasing access to the arts. Her current client roster includes Alvin Ailey Dance Company, the Apollo Theater, the Lion King, Aladdin, and this year's Tony winner, Once on This Island, and the new play, Little Rock. She has repped A Raisin in the Sun, starring Denzel Washington, A Trip to Bountiful, starring Cicely Tyson, Porgy and Bess, featuring Audra McDonald, and Norm Lewis, A Streetcar Named Desire, with Blair Underwood, Alicia Keys in Stick Fly, Hairspray, Ragtime, and Thurgood, starring Lawrence Fishburne. And back in the day when we first met, she was working for the public theater, and we both bonded around uh, Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk. She provides consulting services to numerous arts and government organizations around the country and worldwide. So every time I look up on Facebook, Donna's in Australia, Germany, Russia, Japan, and South Africa. They call her there to help them understand how to extend their arts to a wide variety of not only audiences, but then participants. She is an adjunct professor of over 20 years at New York University and also teaches at Bank Street College and is senior advisor to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Her first book, Invitation to the Party, Building Bridges into the Arts, Culture, and Community, was published in 2005 and is outside at our book table. And when Donna comes, she will introduce our special guest. Please welcome my dear friend, Donna Walker Kuhn. Wonderful to be here. I love Washington. I had the good fortune uh, to go to Howard University, so I got to, to love, fall in love with uh, Washington as a student, um, uh, studying law at the law school. They separated the law school from main campus, but still, I was at Howard. So I am really happy that Isasara allowed me to come and share some of the thinking and um, opportunities I've had to build diverse audiences over the years uh, for arts, culture, uh, and, and education. And what I wanted to do today uh, is to talk about a little bit about my work, but to talk about in the framework of the Civil Rights Movement and, of course, our special guest, uh, Mr. Ernest Green, who was one of the Little Rock Nine. And I don't know if you're aware, but in New York, we actually have this production running, which has been many years in the making, but we have an off-Broadway run of Little Rock, and very fortunate that Mr. Green has been available and has helped to inform uh, the audience's understanding of this work. So, Mr. Green, can you please join us? It's Ernie Green. And of course, we all know that because of Mr. Green and the rest of the Little Rock Nine were able to have somewhat of an equitable educational experience these days. So I'm going to start, Mr. Green, and then we're going to 
bring you into the conversation. So as um, Isisar mentioned, you know, my work has really been based around uh, building diverse audiences. And why is that so important? I think it's because, you know, without really respecting the dignity of human life and really respecting what each culture brings to the table, we have uh, tremendous misunderstandings, which is a lot of what we experience today. And so I've been fortunate to try to create a framework of leadership um, that acknowledges that differences is actually a good thing to celebrate and to be curious about that so that we can understand the demographics of, of so many different behaviors. And I've had the pleasure of working on so many productions that have allowed me myself personally to learn about different cultures, not just in the United States, but around the world. And I really believe that this is how we're going to move forward uh, as a civilization to a more positive place. And so when we talk about building audiences, uh, you know, the first thing we have to do is build awareness of the production. We have to educate our community. Uh, we have to bring our groups together. And my team, uh, my staff, who they're absolutely wonderful, we've, we have fine-tuned how to do that to make sure we get results. You know, whenever you're working on a commercial project, the bottom line is to make money. So when we're working on a Broadway show, yes, you all are lovely. We're so happy you're in the room. How many tickets did you sell? And so that relates back to how much can we engage uh, communities of color? Uh, because the landscape is changing. So when you look at America, think about who's here. Oh my goodness, with all the immigration and migration, you know, this is not a country that's just black and white, but it's very brown as well. And so how do we make sure each of these constituents feel invited to the party, feel as if that they can have a seat at a theater and enjoy a story, a narrative? Um, that's about someone that's different. And so we spend a lot of time educating our constituents about the work itself. With Little Rock, it was not so difficult because so many people are aware of the significance of 60 years ago, this group of nine students who decided they wanted to get a better education and, and the price that they paid for that. Um, and so that is something, you know, we've not had to do a lot of letting people know what the genesis of it is, but we still have to bring them to the theater. You know, so even though you might have a work that is solid, clear, has built in historical legacy, you still have to take the steps to actually get that to translate into box office. And so those are some of the things that uh, we've been working on for the past few months. And fortunately, when we have um, participants, you know, from the story that make themselves available, it really helps. So when we can say we can bring one of the Little Rock Nine to your church, and we've done a series of visits to faith-based institutions, to educational institutions, we've done a lot of media. So all of these things, it's like a formula, it's like this menu you put together of how do you really you know, make sure people feel that this is for them. And so this is kind of the work um, that we've been doing over the years. And I wanted to share you know, why it's so important, this particular play. As my company, we work with quite a few productions. Um, Little Rock is, is special. You know, and this is one of the reasons I believe it is. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Darren Walker. He's the president of the Ford Foundation, African-American gentleman. And he said uh, his commitment to preserving the history of African-American culture and the importance of legacy is tremendous. And what he says is that the American narrative is rich and vibrant and exciting. Um, but there's this unique confluence and contradictions of our culture and our national identity and we've not fully captured the fullness of our history. So the narratives have not been fully transcribed, so it's important for people like Mr. Green to be at the table to make sure we get it right. So that's one of the reasons why Little Walk is so important and why we're working so hard to engage the community, uh, because this is part of America's history. It's not just a dream or fantasy that someone thought of, and there's nothing wrong with those, but this is actually what happened. Um, and so we want to make sure that that story is told well. Um, and so that is what we really want to talk about. Mr. Green, you know, how you feel as a participant, the significance of this play, telling the stories, and what do you want people to leave with? Well, I, I suppose you, the question you always get asked is, how mm -hmm. does it feel yeah. to see yourself on stage? Right. And um, as you indicated earlier, this is a project that's been in the works for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they captured, uh, for me, uh, they, that we were teenagers. Uh, we were uh, not globalists in any, any broad sense, but we were affected by the things around us. Uh, the Emmett Till 
murder was uh, something that really mm -hmm. uh, seared my consciousness. Uh, the mm -hmm. Montgomery bus boycott began in 55 and uh, came to its, its uh, 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 boil by the time we were in high school. Uh, Ghana became an independent state uh, in March of 1957. So all these things were going on, and, and uh, I think that the play captures the fact that, one, we were just teenagers, but mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. once we got uh, immersed in the middle of, of this enormous uh, 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 entity, uh, we had to figure out what we were going to do. One, of course, whether we were going to stay there mm -hmm. and how we stayed there. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, how we would concentrate uh, on our studies. And then the third one was the impact on our families mm -hmm. and uh, how we function. And, and the play, again, to me, captures uh, the interplay between ourselves, our parents, our friends, uh, mm -hmm. and what Little Rock meant going to Central was somehow um, an act of defiance. And we thought, initially, since we lived in the district, uh, we had seen the school every day. Uh, we knew that they had more course diversity mm -hmm. than we had at, uh, at the all-black school. Um, and we thought that they represented the best education that Little Rock had to offer at that point. And needless to say that uh, 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 the uh, writers and directors of the play uh, captured that. They, they got that part, I think, down to a T. Beautifully. And mm -hmm. that uh, you walk away with an understanding that we were families first. Yes. And that second, all of this uh, exposure and uh, uh, publicity and, and and the fact that Eisenhower had to send uh, mm -hmm. uh, federal troops to protect us to go to school, mm -hmm. you know, I, I look around and uh, and at least for the nine of us, I, I think we all thought, you know, this wasn't, we didn't sign on for all this, but right. here we are. And uh, we had enough moxie to know that we were in the middle of a, uh, of a, huge uh, discussion and that uh, we were going to stay with it until we completed it. So I know that the NAACP played a critical role in mentoring you, as well as your families, as you mentioned, but also your church. And so can you just talk a little bit about how a community within a community can help build legacy and give you the muscles to sustain uh, your, your, yourself and endure through really, really challenging experiences? Well, this is, Little Rock is three years after the Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. of Brown. Brown v. Board. Uh, Brown v. Board. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I always thought that the decision is great, but how, you, how are you going to implement exactly. it? Exactly. And so that uh, Little Rock became, it was regarded as a, quote, moderate southern city. Uh, that uh, clearly Jackson, Mississippi wasn't going to be one of the cities that uh, uh, was going to be an early uh, uh, applicant of the, uh, of the Supreme okay. Court decision. Okay. But Little Rock, mm -hmm. the, the uh, powers that be wanted to adhere to the Supreme Court decision. They, they were adhering because they were being sued by the NAACP and by led by a woman who really uh, uh, hasn't gotten her due in the, yeah. in the history books, Daisy Bates. Mm -hmm. But Daisy Bates was president of the NAACP for Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, she, was, uh, she brought the first suit against the Little Rock School Board. Uh, we were the second group. I, I assume that the Little Rock School Board thought they had worked out an arrangement the governor at that time was Orville Faubus, and supposedly uh, this was going to be a, uh, an arrangement that would allow us to go to school there. Uh, they were going to do gradual integration. 
the nine of us represented, uh, there was six girls, three boys, mm -hmm. and uh, we were, uh, 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 I was the only one in the 12th grade. So the NAA, in putting this together, uh, the summer of uh, 1957, they asked students who were interested in, uh, who lived in the Central District, who were interested in going to Central that fall to sign a sheet of paper. And we all signed up, not expecting wow. that this was gonna be earth changing <laughs> and, and uh, life shattering. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, I think the play captures one thing that's very important, that mm -hmm. it was really the strength of our families yes. and the uh, institutions like the church. Three of us mm -hmm. came out of the AME church, uh, uh, Gloria Ray Cosmock and Melba Fertilla Bills and myself all grew up in the same church in Little Rock. So these, in, these other institutions were the ones that helped prepare us. Mm -hmm. And I, I was active in the Boy Scouts and my wow. next door neighbor, his grandfather <coughs> was a scoutmaster. And so I became an Eagle Scout through uh, support that uh, that they had, but it was where you see a, a village come together and support mm -hmm. uh, the young people who didn't realize that we were going to still be talking about my high school 60, 60 years, years later. later. <laughs> wow. So, you know, what you're talking about, I think, is so critical today when we think about what is the role of community. Um, and building diverse audiences is all about engaging communities. And so here we have this incredible example of how this community helped to prepare these nine young warriors to take on the country, you know, and to really defy, you know, what would have been a very, uh, well, it was very severe already, but you all were able to claim a victory you know, different ways, different kinds of victories, but you were able to definitely be able to do that. And so why this is so important, this is part of the fabric of American history. And then part of the responsibility my company has is to make sure that the communities and audiences are aware of this and they can experience this so that we become more informed and I think more respectful. So when you meet a person like Mr. Green and you realize, my goodness, 60 years ago, you went through that just to get a degree? just to finish high school, then it kind of changes your perspective about, you know, what do young black men think about? What do they, what's on their minds? How, what is their strength? Um, so this also is part of why I think the marketing of this kind of production is so critical. Well, and I, I would add that yeah. the work that you're doing, uh, the producer, Harvey Butler, yes. um, is an <laughs> exceptional African-American male mm -hmm. who, didn't know a lot about theater, but obviously, like many things in this country, it's a business, and you have to master the business as well as the creative side. That's right. And that uh, six of us were uh, recently in New York. Yes, for the opening. Uh, for the opening mm -hmm. of the um, uh, of the play. Yeah. And uh, I think each of us, you know, you. You see yourself on stage, uh, at least somebody portraying you. Yes. Uh, it gets to be a little sobering, <laughs> and uh, you, you really think that, you know, this wasn't what I expected was going to be an outcome, but I'm proud to have participated and been a part of it. And I'm glad you brought up Harvey Butler because uh, Harvey Butler is a businessman who fell in love with Little Rock. And for over 10 years, he has really tried every way possible to be able to bring this to the stage. I've had the fortune of working with him over those 10 years, helping to develop, but also to do the marketing for it and to figure out who would be the potential audience. So on opening night, you know, in an off-Broadway theater, for him to be a producer and to, to wear that hat, you know, and run a team, that's, that's historical, that is significant. And it's, it's this, again, community within a community helping to tell the narrative of American history. It's well, really and, and I think, as you indicate, Harvey represents that missing element that if our stories are gonna to be told, you've gotta to have a Harvey Butler uh, to produce it, to be able to raise the, uh, uh, 
funds necessary for it, yes. and to get future generations to understand that while it's a period piece, uh, it's an important part of telling the American story. Yes. And Harvey, you know, uh, when you're working on a, sh a show, a commercial production, you know, you have these weekly advertising meetings, and Harvey can crack the whip. He'll say, and what are you doing? And where's the, the deliverables? And when are the ads being placed? And when, so I was looking at him, I was like, okay. And so it was great, you know, because, again, working on something this important and significant gives all of us a sense of pride and also makes us want to work harder. Uh, because while it's a limited run, it's going to close uh, September 8th, we want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to experience it and to be aware of this living history. So long after all of us are gone, people are still going to talk about Little Rock. And there will be some component of this, we hope, that will be in the theater canon, you know, that can continue this story. Well, I, my, and I, I hope, uh, for those of you who don't know, there are eight of the nine original nine still mm -hmm. still around right that uh, uh, none of us expected to be on Broadway uh, movies or we've had we've been honored by the country to receive the congressional gold medal yep. uh, and lots of awards and uh, little rock mm -hmm. that set of statues to us uh, all of this, as I said to all my friends, I was just simply trying to go to school. Mm. And that, uh, uh, but this movement, and I'm thinking of the uh, March on Washington. I was an undergraduate yes. student at Michigan State, mm. drove all night on the, uh, in August to get here that morning for the march. So wow. those pictures of the 200,000 people, mm -hmm. I'm, Somewhere, my, I'm somewhere in that crowd. Wow. Uh, wow. Because I, I felt that uh, anything that was going to have A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. Bayard Rustin, Dorothy Height, yes. uh, had to be a momentous uh, moment. Exactly. And I wanted to be a part of it. And how appropriate, 60 years later, you're here, it, it, part yeah. of the film festival, which captures so much of those significant moments. So as you've been going around talking about the production and you know, being engaged with different audiences, what, what are you thinking and what are you hearing? If we were to talk about a trend, what is well, the most significant thing you hear? The trend is ob everybody has a vision about how uh, the time today, mm -hmm. and in many ways uh, we, we have, have gone backwards in, uh, in some of our approaches. Uh, but I think the, the main thing that uh, for us, the nine, uh, is that we recognize this is a marathon, mm -hmm. not a sprint. And that uh, uh, it's important for things like the film festival, like the play, to uh, try to approach this in many different ways rather than uh, uh, simply reading history out of yeah. a book. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, mm -hmm. we, this civil rights movement uh, has created a, um, a series of opportunities for younger people, which is what we s set out to do. Mm -hmm. Had no idea that uh, it would take either this long or that there would be interest to uh, stay with it uh, this far. But having said all that, this is about changing the direction of this country. Uh, that um, I looked up the other day, they were talking about reopening the um, uh, uh, examination of Emmett Till yes. murder. Yeah. And I, I told a, fr a friend of mine the other evening that the Emmett Till murder or if you were a young black male, you probably heard from at least 10 people, you got the talk. The talk was, don't get yourself involved right. in, right. In, in a situation in which the outcome is going to be similar to what Till did. But we also learned that Emmett Till's mother uh, mm -hmm. deserves a tremendous applause. Yeah 
for having the guts to uh, uh, have her son's uh, body displayed mm -hmm. because that activity was one of the sparks that moved uh, the, the movement further. Yes. Uh, it, it, yes. it, it made me, I mean, Till and I were near the same age um, and the, the attitude that I had, how can anybody treat another person exactly. in that manner? Exactly. And that I have to do something to uh, support uh, the Emmett uh, Till's uh, uh, history and, and, and his legacy. Mm -hmm. And that all of these events, um, that I, I point back to a 11th grade uh, high school history teacher who taught American history to black kids out of the Carter G. Woodson's book, The Miseducation yes, the American Negro. of the American Negro. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that book was a conscience raising for me because it showed that slaves were not happy. I mean, if you look if you look at all the books in the, that came out after, uh, uh, you know, uh, Reconstruction and, mm -hmm. and um, during the Jim Crow period, they, the South continually portrayed that uh, slavery was somehow a, uh, a, a positive and that, uh, and that, that uh, uh, providing freedom for the slaves was going to be a, a destruction of the South. I mean, the, the argument we're going through now about statues and, uh, and, and the Confederacy. I saw all of this as a reason why I should step up and do my little part. I didn't know what, but I knew I wanted to do something besides sit on my hands. Wow. And that uh, when the moment came mm -hmm. for the, to go to Central, I said, I want to sign up. And uh, as it turned out, uh, I say Little Rock Central High School is a, a site that keeps on giving. <laughs> but I think for young people today is you can't, we all are going to have a Little Rock moment. Yes. And the trick is can you recognize it and can you take advantage of it? And um, I, I think what I've learned is you got to be prepared but when that moment comes, because if not, it'll simply pass you by. Mm. And what a miss that would be. Wow. Well, you, you just mentioned Little Rock Moments, and then we're going to open up for Q&A. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight the Little Rock Moments that we've been enjoying aligned with this production in New York has been organizations that have really embraced the production. Of course, the NAACP, uh, they're going to have their own night where they can talk about the impact of this. But we also have a number of legal groups. We have students. We have churches. And we have the AARP, which have been a wonderful supporter of, of this production as well. Uh, and so it's been an opportunity to bring together various communities to celebrate this legacy and important narrative in American history. So now we'd like to see if you have any questions or comments. So I have a, a comment and a question, and then I have the mic for all of you. The comment is when you spoke about uh, after Emmett Till was killed, you're getting the talk. Uh, I remember my father talking about uh, being taught how to behave around white people especially when things were going to be tense. And that's similar to the talk that we now give our young people about how to behave around the police. So in some ways, things have not changed. My question for you, Donna, is can you speak a little bit about the producing process? What happened over those 10 years? And what kind of work does a producer have to do in order to bring something to Broadway or off-Broadway? So the, the first responsibility of a producer is to find the money. Hopefully not his money, but OPM, other people's money. And so that is the first goal, setting your budget so you know how much you need. And you, then you're going to need more than whatever that projection was. And then you have to be in love with the work. It has to be driving you. You have to be so passionate you can't sleep. I mean, literally, it is such a work of love. Uh, and so that's how it was with Harvey. I mean, this, this was a ghost and a demon chasing him, 
where he had to make sure the story came to life on stage. And so the producer's job is to build the production, which means hire the general manager, hire the, towards the director, the director then establishes their cast, um, and then the producer's constantly bringing in new money because you keep finding these hidden costs. And what you originally thought it was, oh, add another five or six zeros behind that, and you might be close. And so Harvey's always bringing in different producers. We had uh, several cultivation dinners. Uh, we were trying to engage uh, people who could invest in the production. And investors understand from the very beginning there may not be an ROI. I can't imagine any producer, even like for Evan Hansen, maybe for Hamilton they did, but rarely will a producer like guarantee you're going to get your investment back plus. Very rarely, because so many variables happen on Broadway that can sh close a show or, you know, beyond what you're doing. But for instance, when 9-11 happened, you know, there was a tremendous financial loss. People were just afraid to go out. Um, and so the role of the producers to have this vision of what this can be, who the audiences are, and then keep it on track. And so every day, they're not just studying the reps, which are the, the daily sales reports, but they're studying everyone's job and making sure they're performing 100%. So it's a huge role, and I, I bow to uh, any producer. I think it's really significant. When you uh, talked about having a passion for it, uh, it reminded me one of the blessings I have from doing this every year is hearing so many different stories about the civil rights movement, but from so many different sources. And several years ago, we had Claudette Colvin, who uh, preceded Rosa Parks when she was 15 years old in refusing to get off a bus and getting arrested. And she talked about how when she was on that bus, she felt Harriet Tubman push her on one shoulder, and Sojourner Truth push her on another shoulder, and they were holding her in that seat. She could not get up. She's 75 years old now, and every time she says that, you feel that same passion you were talking about. Any questions? My question is about what you said about um, Little Rock being the most uh, optimal place of the places to consider for that. Both sides of my family are from Arkansas. So on one level, I maybe kind of understand because there were a lot of black people who owned land there. So from even the time, you know, before this time, my family was from a central uh, Arkansas area where even though all that was going on, they were pretty autonomous and they were um, almost like equals in the community because they, collectively bargain in terms of labor and their own land and that type of thing. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that concept of if how strategic it was to pick Little Rock and then Central High School, if you know any of that aspect of the story. Well, I, I think uh, part of the uh, reason Little Rock was picked was because of Daisy Bates. You had leadership. Uh, that uh, was willing to uh, stand up and uh, uh, go against conventional thought. Um, and then secondly, um, you had a, a, uh, a history of, uh, of students at, at, uh, at Horace Mann and Dunbar, which were Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which were the uh, black high schools at that time who uh, uh, had, had achieved uh, and done fairly well. So you had, with the, with the uh, role that Mrs. Bates played, uh, the fact that, uh, as I said earlier, the families, uh, that uh, our families uh, who were willing to stand up, and, and you know, this is, I'm sure in your discussion of the movement, uh, you know that everybody in every, every African-American community was not 100% behind civil rights movement. There were, there were, I had a neighbor who came up to me and said, you guys are messing things up because you're going to go away to college, you're going to leave all of this for us to have to deal with, and these people are going to take it out on me. And that uh, life is going to be worse off for me, once you get into that school, because somebody's going to always uh, try to uh, take it out on the, on the black community. And um, I think the attitude 
preparation, the fact that uh, people like B uh, Mrs. Bates and others, uh, expectation was it was going to be a relatively uh, 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 smooth uh, uh, ride. And uh, Governor Forbes had, uh, was regarded as a Southern moderate. And uh, e expectation was that he was going to agree to, uh, to, uh, uh, to our going to Central. And, and it, this really wasn't a pipe dream on our part, because the University of Arkansas had admitted uh, a few uh, black students in the medical school. Uh, tonight, um, tomorrow night, I think you're having uh, 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 a uh, program on the Arkansas Supreme Court, and a friend of mine, uh, Richard Mays, who was one of the uh, the uh, first Supreme Court justice in Little Rock in Arkansas, uh, was a law student who came in before we went to Central. The point I'm trying to make is that we thought the atmosphere was going to be one in which we would have, quote, reasonable <laughs> acceptance. Uh, didn't expect the riots, didn't expect the troops, uh, but once all of that unfolded, uh, my attitude, and I think my attitude of the other eight was, uh, we're here now, we're gonna see this through and uh, complete our task. Good afternoon, and thank you both for sharing your time and your stories. I'm especially impressed with your work in terms of supporting the arts, especially on the theater side. We got a lot of folks on the movie and television, but yours is a special gift I know as an artist myself. So, um, And Mr. Green, I, good to see you again. The last time I saw you, you were at the uh, Commerce Department. So, <laughs> Um, I want to know how you stayed, both of you, how you both stayed passionate about your goals when you were younger and what that, if that vision has manifested itself and some of the other directions you think we should be focusing on as well as social justice. Like for me, uh, having been in the business world and on the side of um, helping small businesses, stuff like that, I clearly understand that we have a, a focus that we need to recapture with regard to economics. So how has that informed your choices in both your personal and professional careers? And uh, I do have some of your ideas, uh, some of yours, Mr. Green, but I'd like to know from both of you and maybe you can share that with the audience. Wow, that's quite a question, thank you. Um, I grew up in Chicago on the South Side, so it's very segregated, so I grew up uh, being taught not to trust white people. Um, so I didn't know any white people. I made it a point not to, um, because I wanted to still live. And so everything I did was about being uh, African American and learning my culture. So going through high school, going to college, you know, I was in an African dance company. So I have a twin sister and we arranged our schedule so that our college classes were from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. so we could spend the rest of the day taking dance classes and teaching class in our community in Chicago. And then when we both decided to go to graduate school, I just knew I wanted to go to an HBCU. And Howard was the place I wanted to go to to continue supporting the growth of my identity, but also learning how to give back and be a part of my community. Um, and so practicing law for a couple of years in Brooklyn, you know, I was you know, prosecuting juveniles, but I didn't feel as if I was fulfilling my mission. And that was back to the arts. And so I volunteered at an arts organization, taught myself everything I know while I was prosecuting juveniles, and then started to work full time and wrote a letter to Arthur Mitchell at the Dan Theodore Parnum and was hired. So that began my career as an arts administrator. So my purpose in life is to create access to the arts. And I will do that until there's no breath left. And when I try to do something else, it comes back to this. So I do it wearing different hats. I teach, I write, I blog, I consult. You know, I travel around the world, I do keynotes, but all of it is one theme, respecting the dignity of each person's life, creating access to the, to the arts, to have a life that's fulfilled and respectful and honorable. Ain't she wonderful? That deserves applause. Well, I, I suppose I, 
I, uh, I've stumbled upon the arts. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the first uh, summer after Central High School, Terrence Roberts, who's one of the nine, and I lived in New York. We got summer jobs because we couldn't get summer jobs in, uh, uh, in Little Rock. And the uh, outcome for me that summer was Thelonious Monk came back, played at the five spot in New York. And every night that I could get there, I went to hear Thelonious Monk. So I, I heard more Monk than anybody else in the, in the world, I felt, and, and enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, I also uh, had a, uh, have had a series of jobs that uh, intersect with art activity. Uh, I ran the uh, job training program for the A. Philip Randolph Institute, had a chance to work with A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and the, a lot of people, in fact, uh, always said that uh, if uh, Bayard hadn't done what he needed to do, you never would have heard Dr. King's speech. Uh, that uh, he was really the guy who made the trains run on time and uh, really produced the, uh, the march. Um, but those of us who part of the movement, I think we all have come away from it. Uh, one, wanting to make certain that what we started continues. Uh, secondly, that uh, it, it has the uh, uh, impact that people you as an audience, our producers, our directors, our, uh, our film people uh, know that uh, there are probably a lot of other things you could do in your life, make a lot more money, uh, those creature comforts. But I go back to, uh, I think, one of the lessons we learned from Little Rock, that the creature comforts were things that our parents and guardians put on the line. I mean, they, they knew life could become very difficult, that uh, house notes and car payments and providing uh, educational opportunities for other children in the family were all things that they had to do. And they did all that, and yet they sacrificed uh, for a future that uh, uh, hopefully we can take advantage of. And to me, uh, that's really the, uh, that's the multiplier uh, about, the, uh, about the movement, about the people who were involved, uh, that Rosa Parks uh, kept her seat. But E.D. Nixon, who was a sleeping car porter, and was head of the Montgomery Improvement Association, the one who convinced Dr. King, who was reluctant to participate uh, initially. E.D. Nixon was a guy who, had, uh, who knew how to organize. And uh, we have to 